Welcome to the League of Women Voters July virtual, pro virtual luncheon and program. I'm Dorothy Engelman, Vice President of Programming. Today's meeting it is, is a discussion of the events around uh, the movie Just Mercy, which uh, told the true story of Walter McMillan and his lawyer, Brian Stevenson. Our, three, uh, with, our discussion is with three folks who are involved in the criminal justice system. First, a thank you to Susan Chalgen, who arranged this program, and we're delighted that uh, she was able to find these excellent speakers that we have with us today. I'd also like to thank Camilla Davis for helping with audience questions. We now have a survey to put on the screen. Um, if you would take a moment and click on that, we'd appreciate it. I think there's a survey. Donna? There we go. Okay, just if you had an opportunity to see Just Mercy or have you read the book? So if you'll just click yes or no on that and then we'll move forward. Okay, I think our panelists can do that too. I'm gonna, nope, I guess I can't. So, okay, thank you very much. Um, Donna, can I see the results of that? Okay, so more than 77% of our audience has had an opportunity to do that. Wonderful. And I think that that will, um, even for those of you who haven't had that opportunity, I think that you'll definitely still benefit from our discussion today. Before we begin the program, I'd like to introduce Donna Mullins, President of the League of Women Voters of the Lansing area, and our technical guru. So, Donna? Hi, I, I'm a technical guru because I have two weeks more experience than anyone. The, uh, uh, the uh, Welcome. The League is really pleased about doing this. We're very interested in social justice. Uh, we, uh, we were all running out to the theaters during the movie. I have a background in uh, juvenile ju uh, justice areas too, so this is really important to me and I really look forward uh, to hearing from our really outstanding panelists. Welcome to you all. Thanks a lot. Okay, hey, Dorothy. Okay. As you know, or may know, Just Mercies tells the story of Walter McMullen McMillan, excuse me, who, with the help of his young defense attorney, Brian Stevenson, appealed his murder conviction. The film, which begins in 1989, is based on the memoir of the same name written by Stevenson. Um, we're fortunate that we have some questions and our speakers will uh, answer those related to justice around the events. First, I'd like to begin with introducing Jose Burgos who is a former juvenile lifer who served 27 years incarcerated in, within the Michigan Department of Corrections. He is currently a reentry specialist with SADO, Project Reentry, and a current member of ICANN, Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network. Helping those within the incarcerated population was a passion he discovered, developed while incarcerated, and it's a passion he continues to embrace. Since his release, he's made a conscious decision to share his experience, hoping to sense, shed some light into the criminal justice system as it pertains to incarcerated children. He also strives to be a positive example for those who are released from prison. He said, I want to show them that as long as you're determined to do what is right, many doors can open, can open that were once shut. He read the book, Just Mercies While Incar Incarcerated, and has been on several uh, previous panel discussions, and we're delighted to have you here, Jose. Thank you. Kathy Swedlow is the Deputy Administrator of the Michigan Appellate Assigned Counsel System, better known as MAACS, and a part of the Michigan Appellate Defender's Office, SADO. Um, she's been involved in death penalty cases as an attorney, representing death, sentence, death sentenced prisoners as a federal clerk working with judges deciding capital cases and a law professor writing about capital cases. Kathy is the former director of the Cooley Innocence Project and was co-counsel on the first DNA exoneration obtained through Michigan's post-conviction DNA testing law. She also taught law for 15 years. Her current position involves appeals for indigent clients and overseeing private attorneys um, working with those cases. And we appreciate you being here today with us, Kathy. Mike Chiltonham is the Inton County 
chief assistant prosecuting attorney and has been with the prosecutor's office in various roles since 1999. He supervised uh, attorneys in both circuit and district courts. He also was with the child abuse and child sex crimes unit. He was the, he was the chief of that unit and worked with the Tri-County Metro Narcotics Unit. Prior to joining the uh, Ingham County Prosecutor's Office, he was the Deputy Public Advocate representing indigent clients accused of felonies in Mount Morency County. Um, as you can tell, we have some excellent, excellent uh, speakers with us this evening, or this afternoon. So thank you all for being here and our first question. Um, and I'd like to remind the audience that as we're going along, you have the opportunity to ask questions in where it says Q&A on your screen, and Camilla will then pass those questions on to me as we um, have an opportunity to ask those. Um, Kathy, let's start with you, and I'll give the other two an opportunity to answer the same question, but could you tell us about a situation that made you feel that the accused was not being treated fairly? Um, based on the breadth of your, your background? I would say that that's virtually every capital case that I ever worked on. Um, I think that when I go back to my experience in representing capital cases, and I was working in Pennsylvania, which um, had and still does have a pretty active death penalty, um, the, f the fighting that was required to get basic tools for the defense um, was really kind of extraordinary. And so, you know, I can, I can think of individual cases, but I would say it's a kind of across the board situation, trying to get resources so that you can represent your client, trying to get access to money so you can have experts so that they can weigh in. And it's mostly, you know, in a lot of instances, just trying to level the playing field because, you know, my adversaries did have those tools at their disposal, but we were just trying to get the same kind of tools so that we could fight them, you know, on the, on the same level. So it's more of a, a across the board situation. Okay, Mike, how would you answer that question? Um, I guess I'd echo a little bit what Kathy says, but in, in the sense that um, we do see often uh, defendants who are treated unfairly. Um, and for us, the tension is, um, is that unfairness as a result of um, what we're doing and what we want the ultimate goal, the just goal to be and um, what the law requires. Um, I guess a, a good example of that, just last week, we, uh, we had an R&O case involving a 17-year-old who um, was um, on video interfering with the arrest of her uncle. Um, you know, she's uh, 17 as an adult uh, in the state uh, currently, um, and we charged her with R&O. Um, but after looking at the video, and um, actually as a police chief who asked us to review it, we went back and saw that, yes, this is a, uh, you know, it, it's what we believe would be a crime that we could prove in court. Um, but when you look at it, given the circumstances, she, you know, she tried to interfere physically with the arrest, but she, she was a small child who didn't have the ability to stop the three or four officers who were arresting her uncle. Um, she, you know, it, it didn't seem to serve their uh, purpose that we wanted to. And so you see things like that all the time where as a prosecutor, there's, um, there's what you can do legally and there's the tension between between what is the uh, what is the right thing to do and where you want to see the case end up eventually, and so uh, it's something we, we encounter um, pretty pretty frequently. Okay, thank you. And and Jose, again, let me just re through, repeat the question for you. Can you tell us about a situation that made you feel like the accused was not being treated fairly? Um, yeah, um, I think about uh, the juvenile lifers here in Michigan, um, where um, the, the treatment that they receive is, is, is really based on the p political climate of whatever county it is they come from. Um, you have uh, juvenile lifers, I'm um, giving an example, um, where in Wayne County, there was more juvenile lifers that were processed. Um, and like you have counties like Oakland County and certain counties where um, based on the political climate there, um, the process hasn't, hasn't gone nowhere. You know what I'm saying? Where juvenile lifers, um, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be based on where you're from. If the Supreme Court said that all juvenile lifers um, need to be resentenced, then they should be resentenced. It shouldn't be based on whether you were Oakland County or whether you're in, in, in Wayne County or any other, any other place. You know, um, I experienced and came across myself personally, a lot of juvenile lifers that were very, very worthy of that second chance, very, very worthy of getting resentenced, but because they weren't from a certain county, they're still staying in prison uh, today. So I, I've seen it all across the board. Okay, could someone please speak to the resentencing law? I don't, I'm not familiar with that. How do, can you tell us what that, what that means, please? Yes, yes. Um, in 2012, uh, the United States Supreme Court 
um, ruled that it was unconstitutional to give mandatory life without parole um, for children, not only here in Michigan, but across, uh, across the country. Um, so when that took place, um, Michigan was actually one of the, uh, one of the states where the, where the attorney general um, prolonged it. He, you know, he, he kept on fighting in the courts. He were, basically what he was saying was that the changes in the law uh, should not be applied to those that were already convicted and incarcerated, that it should just be you know, applied to the ones coming forward. So again, in 2016, the United States Supreme Court ruled that it was retroactive, that not only did it applied to old cases, but new cases as well. Um, when that happened, the Michigan legislat uh, legislation um, kicked in um, where they basically left it up to the prosecutors as to whether they were going to pursue life without parole again or pursue a term of years. Um, so that kind of like tied things up. Um, and so certain counties, um, like certain counties, and again, I'm, I'm gonna use Oakland County, for example, they were pursuing life without parole um, at least about in 98% of the cases um, where the, the uh, United States Supreme Court said that that sentence should only be applied to the worst of the worst. Um, so that's what's been holding things up there. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Dorothy, um, could I just add one thing on top of what Jose said? Just to, to give people an idea of the magnitude, um, Michigan had hundreds of juvenile lifers. I believe Pennsylvania was the highest um, number of juvenile lifers, but Michigan was number two. So this isn't 20 cases to resolve. This was a huge number, and many are still unresolved. Are they currently in litigation? They're currently in litigation, and there's still attempts to um, go forward with those sentencing hearings, but, and our office represents a number of those juvenile lifers and then private counsel represents a number of other juvenile lifers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question. Um, I understand that the accused is entitled to defense attorney. Um, is it your experience that a public defender provides the same quality of defense as a higher paid attorney? And how do you see this having an effect on justice? Um, who wants to go first? I've got a volunteer? Okay, Kathy. I'll go first. I, um, I would say the public defenders are the best. Best things in life are free. Um, the, the reason why I say that is because when, when a defendant or a person is represented by a public defender, they're represented by somebody who is specializing in criminal law and specializing in criminal defense not doing other things to pay a mortgage and to run a business and those kinds of things. Um, they're also represented by somebody who is salaried to do just that work. And I think that, you know, when we look at ineffective assistance of counsel and when things go wrong, a lot of times it's attorneys whose interests are split between a variety of different types of practices. I would rather be represented by somebody who is only doing criminal defense all the time rather than somebody who was doing estate planning, a little bit here and some municipal law and a bunch of other things. Um, that's my view about public defenders. Okay. Um, Mike, you work with public defenders, I'm sure quite a bit on the other side mm -hmm. of the table. Um, how would you respond to that question? Um, I do have great respect for public defenders. Uh, I started my career as one. Um, I think also what's important to consider is, is um, overall resources when you're talking about um, who you're dealing with. Um, unfortunately, public defenders um, and court appointed attorneys prior to the public defender system um, did not have the resources they needed to adequately defend folks. But I find that um, you know if people have uh, all the resources they need and um, public defenders should have more, then uh, you're gonna find um, that they can do this, the, the same job that highly skilled um, specialized criminal defense attorneys can do. You know, I've encountered many public defenders um, who I have great respect for in the courtroom um, or, or, you know, people who were court appointed attorneys who I have great respect for in the courtroom. Um, but ultimately, they didn't do some of the things that, say, a private attorney who specializes just in criminal law can do. Um, when, they, uh, when that private attorney can go in and um, mock trial a case um, a couple of weeks before trial and get a couple of different, uh, different ideas of what's going to happen and play that out, um, that's just not something that, uh, you know, traditionally public defenders or court appointed attorneys have been able to do. So I think it depends on the, um, on the particular lawyer, but I think if, if everyone has the same amount of resources and they're, um, they're able to um, do everything that's necessary to adequately defend a person, I think, uh, I think that's the more, uh, the more dispositive factor as to whether or not uh, one's better than the other. 
thank you. Jose, do you have anything to add to that? I would say, I would say, um, um, public defenders are, are do a great work, great job. Um, the only thing, in, in my opinion, is that they're underfunded. I think if, you know more funding um, would 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 uh, would do uh, do them a lot a lot of justice and and being able to to represent the client as as best as possible. Okay, thank you, um, Camilla. Do we have any questions from the audience yet? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so we'll go ahead with my next prepared one. Just one moment. Let's see. Okay, so audience, if you have questions, please remember to use your um, Q&A button and um, I'll pass it on to our speakers. Um, in the movie, Just Mercies, we saw that uh, Attorney Stevenson worked very closely with his client, both sitting close to him and getting to know him and his family. Um, for those of you who have practiced law, and still are obviously, but when you were working in a, in a different um, uh, position, um, do you get to know the people who, that, are, that you're working with that are accused of the crime? And do your feelings ever have an effect on how the accused is treated? Um, Mike, let's go to you first. You said you started out as a public defender. So let's, how, did, how do you work with a client? How did you work with a client and how do you get to know them? Is what, is what Brian Stevenson did by going and visiting the family and um, those kinds of things, something that lawyers do? Uh, yes, many lawyers do it. If they aren't, they should be doing that. Um, getting to know your client is very important. Um, first of all, because uh, your, your client always has um, information that you know is vital to uh, representing them. Um, so that's, you know, I, I visited often with my clients when I was a public defender. Um, now that I've become a prosecutor in the past several years, one of the things that I can closely analogize it to is that when we work with um, cooperating defendants um, who are testifying um, in behalf on, on our behalf, um, and they're getting, uh, you know, a plea bargain as a result of that. You have to spend a lot of time talking with them as well. And ultimately, I end up uh, finding that, um, you know, that reminds me of the, the humanity of the person I'm dealing with when talking about someone who's committed a crime. Um, so it's, it's, it's an important perspective that you have to have um, in order to be able to accurately and, and fairly come to a conclusion as to what should be um, the outcome. Um, when dealing with uh, cooperating defendants, you know, you try and meet with them as often as you can. Sometimes, uh, you know, they want to meet with you um, and sometimes they don't want to meet with you. Um, but, you know, as long as you're in communication with folks, um, you're going to find out um, who they are. Um, you're going to find out information about them that helps you um, come to a better decision as to how to approach their case and how to approach, especially with people who I'm ultimately going to have to end up bargaining with. Um, what is fair and, and what is right for that person. I can tell you lots of times when I did get to um, support closely with the person, I could figure out um, what was the appropriate deal for them because of information I learned about them, things that had happened in their past that explained how they got to that point that made um, made it easier for me to, to uh, come to what I thought was a fair offer for them so that they, uh, after they got through their incarceration, could move on with their life. So I think it's important, yes. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I agree. It's it's really essential to representation to to know your clients. It's I think it's um, it, it's it's also a way of practice that I is is something that I want to do when I'm representing clients. I, I want to speak to something in particular about capital cases. Um, you know, we saw in the movie in in Just Mercy, um, Mr. Stevenson gets to know his client. A little fuzzy there. Gets to know his client and that becomes so essential to building trust to allow the attorney to go forward. Um, in a capital case, um, a lot of times in post-conviction after the client has been already sentenced to death, a lot of times the, the focus is on whether or not we can get that person a life sentence. You know, obviously, Mr. McMillan, that was a case of innocence, but a lot of times it's about getting a life sentence, which is about really what we call mitigation, looking at the client, looking at their life, looking at why they possibly should not have the death penalty. They should get a, a different type of sentence. But delving into somebody's life very personally, very deeply, you can't do that um, unless your client trusts you. And you can't have your client trust you unless you have a rapport and a relationship with him or her and also with the people around them. So I think it's something important as a human being, but I, I also don't think that a, an attorney can do their job as effectively if they have a barrier or some sort of distance between them and their client. 
Jose, um, obviously you're on that other side um, of it as being the client. Um, with attorneys that you have worked with or that you work with now and see with, with other people, are you in a position to see um, how, it, how attorneys work with their clients as far as finding out things about them and working closely with them? Yeah, I think, I think it's very important. Um, it's just that, that human connection. I think uh, the more and more um, an attorney gets to know their client, I think once once they once they develop that human connection and and see you know where it was that that client comes from and and like the uh, the prosecutor said here uh, Michael said um, you know you, you get to learn how it was that your client got to that point in the first place and I think it's very important I think it's important to to develop that trust um, a, a lot of a lot of uh, clients uh, um, um, always sometimes view public defenders or just attorneys in general to be working with the prosecutors, stuff like that, you know? So I think when you develop that trust, um, it allows you, um, it allows, it allows that, that relationship to, to be a little bit more open, a little bit more transparent, and which makes it a lot easier for the attorney to represent their client uh, as best as possible. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple questions uh, from the audience now. So let's go to audience questions. Um, the first one refers to um, the movie. And in the movie, Brian Stevenson said, we have a system of justice that treats you better, that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. Um, could I get your reactions to that statement? Um, and Mike, you want to start? Um. I believe that's true. Yeah. And I can tell you, uh, my first realization of that was when I was in law school and watching the OJ Simpson case. So I think, um, I think that is true that, um, that's an inequity built into the system, um, that, uh, starts from the very beginning, uh, with, uh, bond and the ability to get out and, and, um, all the way through to the ability to, uh, to hire private attorneys and then, um, to shape sentencing. Um, if you do, if you are in fact convicted and you do have, um, resources. So I think, uh, I think it's true that, uh, yeah, unfortunately that, um, there is a wealth uh, inequity there that needs to be addressed. Okay. Kathy. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, you know, Mike earlier spoke about resources and Jose spoke about funding. Um, when we look at travesties in the criminal justice system, a lot of them are linked to inability to pay. Um, if you just think about McMillan's case and what we learned about Mr. McMillan's case in the movie um, and the state's case into sort of how shabbily it was put together and how many holes, obvious holes there were in there. The question is, if, if he had had an attorney who sort of had the resources to slow down and take the look at the case that Mr. Stevenson did, would Mr. McMillan have ended up where he was, right? And, you know, that's just one example, but there are lots and lots of other examples. And, you know, sometimes when we look at um, innocence cases, we often see this. Um, something that today looks so glaring and so obvious that this person didn't do it and the state's case is, is just not adequate. But nobody caught it at the time because nobody was really paid to do that work. So I, I think that's absolutely true, that statement. And Jose, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, I believe it uh, very much. I, it, the question makes me think about a, a very familiar case um, that was very well known here some years ago in Texas, where you had a kid um, who came from a very good family and was rich. And you know, um, his defense was how he was raised and how you know what I'm saying um, him coming from a previous life. That was his defense, and and it worked for him. Whereas if you have a kid who comes from from um, poverty. You know, nowhere in the country, you know, what I'm saying, is poverty going to be good enough for a defense? You know, and I think that's a clear that's a clear example that uh, um, those who uh, who have money, those who are are in a better position to have a, a good defense uh, uh, team, um, do end up you know in a better situation when it comes to uh, trials and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, it's interesting that, that you all mentioned um, resources because our next question deals with that from the audience. Do the resources that the public defenders have in Michigan also depend on the county resources and how, um, how is the service funded and how could it be increased? Um, is anyone able to speak to that? I'll speak yeah. to it. I, I think it depends if you're talking about trial level resources or appellate level resources. Um, currently the trial level resources are split between 
the counties and the state, and the state chips in a fair amount. That was a result of the Michigan Indigent Defense Act. Um, which has resulted in public defender offices kind of cropping up all over the state, including right here in Ingham County. Um, on the appellate side, though, the, the funds come from the state for the state appellate defender office, but 75% of indigent appeals are handled by private lawyers, and the counties pay for those, um, those lawyers. So it, it depends on what level. It, it gets a little bit complicated. Um, but what I would say is that um, it could be better, and it could be more. Thank you. Either of the other two of you want to comment on that, or shall we go on? Okay. Um, next question from the audience. From Can any of the speakers address the issue of bail for people in jail awaiting their court date? What's the situation in Michigan, and how can help? How can folks help with the presumed in this presumed injustice? Anybody want to give a go? Seeing none, Mike. Okay, Mike, I was just going to pick on you. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, recently there was the task force on, um, on uh, pretrial detention uh, that uh, happened uh, just before COVID and uh, I think got a lot of attention. Um, it, bail is a question that's being addressed at this time. Um, it, it's, it's something that's on the table to be talked about. Um, one of the things that we're finding, uh, at least locally, I can tell you, is that um, our district court judges, our magistrates are um, very aware of what's going on um, when, you're, uh, when you're talking about monetary cash bail and the, um, the impact of that on um, defendants who come before them. Um, you know, it's not just an impact that is um, um, felt in terms of incarceration, but it's the, you know, the ability to get the money to get out, um, where that money comes from usually affects the members of their family, um, their ability to keep generating money, um, because, you know, if you're locked up, you're not, you know, chances are you're not going to have a job when you get back. Um, so, um, and if you're locked up and you don't have a job and you're borrowing money, it's usually um, uh, your, your, your mother, uh, your girlfriend, your wife, you know, um, who are paying for these, uh, paying for uh, folks to, to, to get out to post their bond. And so that has an economic impact on, on um, those closely associated family members. And, and, and it's, uh, it's something that, you know, um, we're moving away from as a county. Um, you know, the court, rule, um, you, the court rule starts off with the presumption that a PR bond is what you should be getting. And so um, our district courts are realizing that and understanding that. And then the question really is public safety um, and flight risk. And as prosecutors, that's what we, we concentrate more on. We're, we're, we make arguments based on public safety and um, whether or not someone is going to be a danger to themselves, danger to the community, and whether or not um, they're going to be a flight risk, whether or not they're going to reappear for court. And so... Um, in terms of hopefully moving the ball forward, our county seems to be going in that direction. We hope to continue going in that direction. But ultimately, I think um, um, anyone who's looked closely at it comes to the conclusion that it's, sort, it's incredibly unfair to use money as the terminator um, as to whether or not someone can get out of jail when they've been accused of a crime. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. So. Any other reactions? And I, I think, I think uh, like you were saying, I can just, doesn't make sense. I mean, you have people who sit in county jails for months and months at a time, um, people who don't have resources, people who don't have families. I mean, you literally got people who, you know, for a hundred dollars, they can get, you know, they can get out of county jail, but they, because they don't have the resources, because they don't have the families, um, they're sitting in jail and it actually ends up costing counties in the States way more money than it would, um, you know, letting them go on, on a personal, on a personal bond. Um, as long as, like you said, as long as they're not a flight race or, you know, they're not a, a threat to, uh, to the society. Kathy, did you want to add anything or? Okay. Um, next question. With the, and this goes uh, back again to the movie, indirectly, I guess. Um, without mentioning names, have you ever witnessed what you thought was blatant racism regarding a case that you've been involved with? Um, and if so, could you share a story about that? Kathy? Um. Well, I'll say two things there. Um, it, you asked for a story, but I'll give you a, sort of a bit of a broader perspective and then a, then a story. Um, when we talk about the death penalty um, and you talk about race, one of the things that um, has been established over and over again is that people who get the death penalty are generally black people who kill white people. 
So in the death penalty world, the race of defendant is important, but also the race of victim, which says that we're valuing lives very differently. And I saw that many times over in my cases, I would say that. Um, if people are interested in knowing about that, I'd recommend you take a look at the death penalty information website. Um, they've got a fair amount of information about that, including studies from many jurisdictions on this issue. In terms of um, specific stories, um, I, I, I remember once uh, talking to a juror in a capital case. My client was African-American, the juror was white. The juror was very proud of the fact that he was known from his friends, around his friends, as Archie Bunker. And maybe I'm dating myself, but some people should know who Archie Bunker is. Um, it's a TV show, Google it if you don't know. Um, and so he was very proud of that. And he was very willing, and he did sign an affidavit for me saying that he wanted to give my client the death penalty because he was, and this were his words, not mine, quote unquote, he was so dark and menacing. And he told me those words in an interview, and I, I nearly fell off my chair. Um, I, I put it in his affidavit. I mean, they were his words, not mine. I was not coaxing him or anything like that. And he did sign that affidavit. And that affidavit was used in part to get my client off of death row. Um, I think that's just one example. I think that there are many other stories and many other examples, but that's just one that comes to mind. Um, that's very profound. Um, Jose or Mike? Yeah, I think uh, for me, you know, um, the vast majority of, of children who, who are sent to prison are, are, are kids of, of color. Um, I, I, I clearly remember um, when I first got incarcerated, um, seeing white kids that came in, same crimes, um, even longer, had like criminal histories and stuff like that. But when it came to sentencing, those children were sentenced as juveniles into the you know, juvenile system and kids of color were, were sent to prison. Um, and that, that happens not only in Michigan, but throughout the country as well. You know, one of the things I think that Jose and Kathy are both talking about is uh, the question is difficult for me in the sense that it's blatant, but it, it is blatant in the sense that the system is just set up that way. Um, it's, it's how the system works. So when you say blatant, I'm not really sure um, what, what that means. Is it the, something I've seen? you know, just specific instances I've seen daily, um, or is it this, what I see daily? And what I see daily is that, you know, um, that race is a huge factor in what happens. Um, Kathy's story reminded me of a time when I was a younger prosecutor in the office and uh, another uh, black prosecutor and I were sitting around and um, we both uh, came to the realization that um, if we were driving, if we were both trying a criminal sexual assault case and um, our defendant was black and our victim was white, um, that neither of us had ever lost one of those. You know, and we were, we were discussing the dynamics of that. Why is that? Why, why does that always seem to happen? Um, is it, uh, and we also question the fact that if you're a black prosecutor and you're in front of a jury in that type of situation, what does that mean for the juror, um, or for the jurors and how they um, see the case? And in some ways, that's some sort of um, implicit permission for you to you know, go ahead and do, and come to a decision based on race because they black prosecutor says this guy's guilty. Does that somehow take, uh, take the, the uh, objectivity away from um, what they're trying to do? Um, so it's, 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 it's just something that's really there all the time. And it's really there in, in, in obvious ways and nuanced ways. And um, it's, it's disturbing. Um, so when you say uh, examples of blatant racism, I think it goes on every day, unfortunately. And it's something that has to be addressed. Um, given our current circumstances with, with everything that's happened since the the George Floyd killing um, and so on. Do you see what, what's your reaction or feeling as far as the general public's um, concern now about what we're seeing as far as the justice system and, and race and are you encouraged or discouraged? Um, Kathy? I think anything that sheds a light is a good idea. I think that, um, you know, if, if you're not part of the criminal justice system, you know, you probably see headlines and read things online, but you probably don't know a lot of the detail and why would you? Um, and so I think that this is the kind of thing that, you know, what we're seeing and reading about in the Black Lives Movement matters. It's causing people to perhaps take a closer look 
And I think that that has to be a net positive. Um, it's not a perfect comparison, but on some level, I kind of compare it to what we learned from the innocence movement. 25 years ago, people didn't think that innocent people went to prison, just would not believe it. And I think now we have, you know, just across the board, we now accept that that does happen because we have seen so many exonerations. So I think anything that sheds a light will hopefully get people to think some more. But this is deeply, deeply ingrained. This isn't just somebody saying, oh, I recognize that racism exists. I mean, this is, these types of biases affect every single act that is performed within the criminal justice system. And so to untease it and to get to a fairer and more just system will take a lot more than just some attention. Better than nothing, but it will take a lot more than that. Jose, do you have a reaction to current situation and, and how this may be affecting what, what you do? Yes, yes. Um, me personally, I'm, I'm a very optimistic, optimistic person. Um, I love the fact that a lot of people are just fed up. They're just fed up, and it doesn't matter whether you're black, brown, or white. A lot of people are just fed up um, of what's going on out there uh, on the streets. Unfortunately, it gives um, – it sheds a, a, a bad light on, on good cops, good officers out there. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm very hopeful that this um, sparks some type of change. And I, and I think I think it starts with allowing those who are most affected by it, you know, allowing them and giving them a seat, a seat at the table to, to hear them out, to, to, to listen to their concerns. And, and uh, so, I'm, so I'm optimistic that, uh, that, you know, moving forward that things will get better, but they are deeply rooted. It's a deeply rooted problem that that it has to start somewhere. Unfortunately, it took George Floyd's life to bring a lot of those things to light. Um, but hopefully, you know, his his death wasn't in vain. Mike, do you want to add anything? Uh, yes, I'm optimistic as well um, and very hopeful. Um, one of the things that um, one of the things that's concerning um, after you get to a certain point in life, you start to realize that, hey, you've seen this before. Um, because I recall being a, a young man in Detroit and um, the case of uh, Malise Green, who was uh, beaten to death uh, by two Detroit police officers with flashlights. You know, that was a long time ago. And this just keeps going on and on and on. And um, this feels a little different. It feels uh, as if it has more intensity. It's, uh, it's been sustained longer. And so I'm hopeful uh, that the movement keeps going forward. Um, but you know, I'm also uh, I'm also a little worried that you know the history in our country has been this flares up. Um, we take some measures, um, then it dies down, and, and we believe, we begin things are fine. We believe things are fine. Uh, we believe we live in a post racial society for a few years, and then it happens again. So um, my hope, my fervent hope, is that it continues and that we do uh, do see real change from this because it's needed. Another question from our um, audience, and this is a way that hopefully you can provide some guidance um, for us to be involved. It says, for league, league members as individuals or the League of Women Voters as an organization, what local organizations would it be good for us to follow, to stay informed, contribute to, or collaborate with? Kathy, I know you mentioned the death penalty site to, to find that. Do you have other resources that... Um, folks like me um, can can support and get involved in or that the league as a, as a whole can can help? Um, well, I, I, again, I would reiterate deathpenaltyinfo.org. Um, I realize that we don't live in a state with capital punishment, but um, the issues in capital punishment um, are just sort of magnified issues that occur everywhere. Um, they're not specialized to death penalty cases. Um, I've, I've actually gotten personally a lot of information um, that's very useful from reading the, my local Black Lives Matters um, Facebook page um, and the posts there. So I would advocate for that. Um, but I'm kind of curious to hear what my other panelists have to say for recommendations. Okay. Do either of you have recommendations of organizations or methods that we can do that? Mike? Um. Yes, I think uh, uh, two things. Um, one is domestic violence, um, which is a, uh, um, 
a big issue in our community, and the other is uh, firearms violence. And with both of those, if you if you can find resources and pay attention to the both of those, um, one of the things that's very one of the things that's very disturbing, um, especially in the city of Lansing, is the number of um, shots fired calls that seem to be increasing uh, with each year. Um, the latest stat I saw was that uh, just in the beginning of this year, um, from January to April, there were two uh, 314 calls of. Uh, reports of shots fired within the city of Lansing. Um, so, you know, there isn't this uh, particular group um, that uh, that I, I'm aware of off the top of my head that you can go and start becoming involved with that. But if you pay attention to that, and if you uh, start to look at that issue more closely, it's, uh, it's something that's very, very prevalent in our community. And the other would be uh, simply domestic violence, because domestic violence is one of the things that uh, has a huge effect on on our community. And then, um, in, is a driver, you know, it leads to other things spur, uh, grow out of domestic violence, other crimes. And so uh, if you can get involved with um, the care program with Lansing Police Department, um, they take volunteers, uh, volunteers who are willing to um, get involved in uh, DV and speaking with victims and working with victims. Uh, in that sense, uh, sometimes you can go as far as to become a volunteer, you get trained and you get to go on domestic violence calls and help uh, get folks, uh, women who have been abused, get them resources and get them in shelters and, and, and help with the PPO process and, and uh, sometimes relocation, things like that. So that's an important program because uh, that type of violence is something that is still uh, still prevalent, uh, still ongoing. Um, we're trying to address that as prosecutors uh, in this particular area um, every day. Um, we're trying to come up with new ways to, to address domestic violence and, and uh, hopefully, uh, if that's something that your group is interested in, they, they can start looking into that and hopefully join some of those organizations that would uh, would assist in that. Okay, thank you. All one had to do was look at the front page of uh, today's Lansing State Journal and, you know, five more people are shot in what looks to be a domestic, um, not necessarily domestic violence, but in a domestic situation. And um, um, you're right, it, it seems over and over and over again. Um, Jose, did you want to add anything to that? I would, I would suggest just you know find find yourself like a, you know a local local organization um, um, that deals with you know issues uh, dealing with the criminal justice system, dealing with um, you know the police situations, stuff like that. I mean, me personally, um, because I work a lot with uh, the juvenile lifers, I I, I uh, I'm involved in organizations like you mentioned at the beginning, uh, the Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network. Um, the ACLU um, is doing a lot of good work um, dealing with helping protesters and, and things of that nature. Um, there's an organization, it's called the uh, Nation Outside, uh, which is actually comprised of the uh, majority of those are uh, returning citizens who are now out there um, advocating for, for uh, sentencing reform, um, criminal justice reform. So I just think, you know, if you find like a local organization um, to get involved in, and, you know, specifically, and you know what it is, you know what I'm saying, you have a passion for, I think that would be great. Thank you. Um, another question, let's just shift this a little bit. Um, do, do any of you have um, experience with the process of plea bargaining? And I think Mike, you mentioned that earlier, and I think Kathy also getting to know your clients and so on. Um, does it serve justice or is it simply expedient and are can you speak to that, um, Kathy? Um, I, th I think it's both. I think it can do both. Um, and it's not a binary thing. Um, plea bargains can be uh, very good options for some clients in certain situations, but when they're used, when pleas are used too frequently or there's too much pressure to plead, um, then you end up with, you know, some unjust results. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a tool, but it's more about the way it's used rather than the tool itself. Um, but I would, I would defer to Mike here because he has more boots on the ground in terms of um, plea bargaining. So I'm kind of curious about his comments. Mike? I, I do agree with Kathy to an extent. Yeah, it's, it's more about how it's used. And for me, and I know we keep coming back to this, it's also about resources. Um, plea bargaining, um, it, to a certain extent, it's necessary uh, simply because doing a trial is such a, a large endeavor that the criminal justice system couldn't do trials for every case that came through. Um, but I think plea bargaining um, is only fair 
and only comes to it comes to the best result when both parties have the resources to be able to point out all the holes and all the defects in their opponent's case and recognize the holes and defects in their own case. Because then, um, and if that information is exchanged, I mean, that's got to be a big part of it. As long as that information is exchanged and the case has been vetted um, through investigators, uh, through lab work, uh, through witness follow-up interviews, things like that, then you start to get um, a better sense of what each side has, and then you can negotiate fairly and honestly. Um, but oftentimes what happens is that what happens is that simply because of sheer volume, um, you know, prosecutors and defense attorneys get into sort of a, uh, we have a standard ideal in our head, what type of case we have and the defendant's record and the circumstances. And we have standard offers that we just throw out there because it's easier and because it moves things along faster than actually getting into the heart of the case and, and going through those details and the background information that you need so that both sides have a fair exchange of information. I think when there is that fair exchange of information and we're not just going off uh, the internal chart that we have in the criminal justice system, uh, then I think you do get, you do get uh, good results based on plea bargains. Okay. Jose, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think, I think plea bargains, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good tool um, if, it's, if it's used correctly. I, I know sometimes um, you have uh, defendants who are overcharged. You know, so when, when, when a defendant is overcharged, and so he, he faces the option of either going to trial and um, taking a chance of, for, for example, you know what I'm saying, facing a life without parole sentence or taking a plea to 10 years. And even though there's been a lot of cases where even though they were innocent, it was, you know, which one are you going to choose? You know what I'm saying? So I think um, when they're originally charged, you know, as long as they're not overcharged, um, then the plea bargain system, I think, works a little better. Okay. Another audience question. In the book, The New Jim Crow, the author makes a compelling case that crime is racialized, um, especially drug crimes. In your opinion, has there been any progress or have there been any changes since that book was written? Reactions? I, I haven't. I haven't read the book myself, mm -hmm. um, but I would I would say something with 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 regards to um, the, the the drug situation, um, and I think that now what what I've seen what I've seen in, in the last few years is that um, with the opioid epidemic um, is that now that um, that drug problem has reached the suburbs, now all of a sudden now it's 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 a health issue, whereas when crack was plaguing the, the inner cities, it was a criminal issue, you know? So I think, uh, you know, that has changed now because of the fact that, you know what I'm saying, those, those drugs are now infiltrating uh, the suburbs. I would say I just to echo Jose's comments. I, I completely agree with what he's saying. I, I know it's hard, it maybe strange for your prosecutor saying this, but you know, back we used to have a war on drugs and that war was, um, it was, urban and it was essentially against black people. And so uh, you had the increase in the federal sentencing guidelines and, and um, you had the uh, police, uh, you know, uh, it, I think at the same time they were starting to ramp up their militarization in census um, because they were doing more raids. So they were looking for better equipment. Um, and, you know, that was, that was when the problem was, uh, was mostly in black communities and we called it a war on drugs and Jose is absolutely right. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, uh, it is, is a little irksome is that now that we've moved to heroin and that heroin has um, so many victims who are, who are, um, who are in the majority, who are white, um, it's no longer about uh, the war. It's now about, uh, it's now more, much more about treatment. It's much more about um, uh, an epidemic, you know, a, a health issue. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's true. And I think Jose is absolutely right in what he says. And it's, it's a little discouraging um, that uh, this wasn't the approach that we should have taken, that we didn't take this approach 30 years ago. Kathy, would you like to add anything? I see you now. I, I can it's see Kathy. Just nodding in agreement. Said it perfectly, both of you. Absolutely. <laughs> Agree completely. Okay, very good. Um, let's see, I had this question. Oh, um, and again, you're no longer, I don't, none of you are working as defense attorneys at the current time, but um, given the inequities in the legal system, including lack of resources, systematic, uh, systemic racism, and so on, how do good defense attorneys stay positive without falling into overwhelming cynicism. Anybody have a, a thought on that one? 
do you see how to, and and even you in your positions how do you, how do you maintain given everything we're looking at how do you not become cynical i think that's the problem with any type of tough work right um and there are lots of people doing lots of different types of difficult work um um, I think about people who are on the front lines medically right now. That's some pretty difficult, that's a d- tough job. Um, I think it depends on the individual person just trying to keep both feet on the ground and to pull back when necessary um, to try and kind of keep some sense of self. But I do think, I think it's a, it's a tough act to do. I think, I think for me, I think for me, it's it just, you know, having that passion, having that passion for the work I do, um, and again, being optimistic, you know, I, I, you know, I, I came from a situation where, you know, I was I was serving a life without parole senses. I was never supposed to come home, you know, and here I am. Um, so I, I, you know, every time that I come across any type of obstacles or anything like that, I always view things through those lenses. Like, you know, you know, at one point I thought, you know, me serving a life without parole senses and me coming home was an impossible thing, you know, and, and here I am. Um, so I just I always keep that in mind you know, when I'm when I'm when I'm helping my clients because some of the very same clients I'm helping are clients who are currently in the same situation I was in. So I'm trying to, you know, with the work I do, I'm trying to give them the same type of hope that that uh, that you know I, I I ended up gaining. Um, Jose, you and I both had an opportunity to speak uh, prior to this, and you said you were very open to questions. Would you mind? Would you please share with the audience? how you move from that person who had no hope as a, um, you know, a, a life with the life sentence to where you got to be where you are now. Um, um, so getting- yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I, I just, you know, I, I found myself one day um, sitting in that prison cell, um, literally having a conversation with God. And I, you know, I was looking in that prison cell and I just, you know, I was having a, a conversation with God and I was like, you know, this can't be it. You know, like this can't be my life, you know. Um, and from very, from, from that very moment on forward, you know, I, I made a conscious decision to start doing things differently, um, thinking differently, acting differently, um, learning about, you know, my situation in the, in the situation that I was in as, as a juvenile life or, you know, getting informed. Um, and so that just, you know, the more and more, I feel like the more and more I, um, was letting go of any type of, you know, negative ideas, negative thoughts, of negative behavior, the more and more um, my freedom was like literally pulling at me. You know, I, I can literally feel like it was almost like a hand, you know, sticking out from, from out here inside of the prison and pulling at me. And the more and more I was seeing the work that was being done out here uh, in the courts, um, um, organizations that would ad- was advocating for, for juvenile lifers, it just, you know, it, 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 it turn on that, that light at the end of that tunnel. And I, and, I, and I started to realize, you know, this is possible. You know, I seen other lifers and they weren't particularly juvenile lifers, but I seen other lifers that had also, um, you know, got home and, and was released from prison. So I knew, so I, I, that's when I started believing that, you know, this is not impossible, that it is possible, but a lot of it is going to be depending on me and, you know, the work that I'm willing to put into it. So, um, you know, it was just, it's, it's, it was a, a great transformation, you know. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to give, as we're, we're wrapping up, we've got about seven or eight minutes left. Um, one of the things that I'd like for each of you to um, speak to, I need to find my sheet of paper that has that question, um, is what are two or th- one or two things that you see that really need to happen for our, our criminal justice system to begin to address these questions Um, from the positions that you're in now and also positions that you've been in before. What is it that you see? um, If I gave you a magic wand, what, what would you do to help improve justice um, in our, in our system? Um, Mike, I'm going to start with you. I guess the one thing, and uh, I can't give you a specific answer, it's just more of an overall um, uh, idea that um, the most important thing that their criminal justice system has to uh, do in my mind is to get back to recognizing um, the the dignity inherent in each and every individual. 
who comes in contact with the system, um, their humanity. Because I think uh, our system, uh, you know, our criminal justice system, our police forces, uh, police departments, they were, you know, historically, if you go back through time, these were, um, these were things that came out of uh, slavery. Um, that's where police, you know, that's where police policing begins. You know, if you go back all the way to beginning, the beginnings of this country. And so there is this inherent um, discounting of people uh, that happens. And um, if we can somehow address that, and there are so many little ways uh, that it happens when people enter the system um, from, uh, you know, the, uh, the loss of dignity and just a, just a police stop. If you are a motorist, if you're stopped and the, the, the things that happen during that time, you know, people are, uh, they're embarrassed, they're exposed and the things that an officer can ask you to do, um, you know, in the name of, uh, in the name of law, in the name of legal search, um, you know, those things have to be uh, modified so that um, we, we go through the system protecting and honoring people's dignity and their humanity. Um, because um, I think that's, that's where the system ultimately loses uh, any, any, any moral justification um, for what it does um, with that absence. Um, I don't know how specifically we go back to doing that. I think it's a, it's a comprehensive overhaul and an approach that um, I haven't heard yet. Um, and I'm certainly have uh, not the ability to offer any suggestion as to how we go about doing that. But it, it to me, it's the most important thing. Thank you. Um, I think when you mentioned that, that one of the things that I was not aware of, um, and others may have been, that has come to light recently, is that our police forces really did grow out of, um, you know, after post-slavery, um, that it was a way of, of doing that. And I think that personally, that um, that's an enlightenment that I think many folks weren't aware of, and that has come to the forefront now. Um, and that's just a personal aside. Kathy, if you could, what would, what do you think we need to do to prevent the injustices that we saw in Just Mercy? Um, so I, I agree with Mike, and I, 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 hopefully I'm paraphrasing correctly what you said a little bit here, but I, I think we need a top-down reevaluation of the way that we view people within the criminal justice system. Um, I'm perhaps... I hope that happens. I'm a little cynical that I don't that it won't. Um, and so my focus is a little bit more concrete. I I think that we need to increase the resources for defense attorneys and to bring them on parity with prosecutors. Um, and and statewide, countrywide, you do see differences between, for instance, what defense attorneys are paid versus prosecutors. But I think it's about training and resources. And I think that that would help prevent some of those injustices or keep them from extending as long as they did. Um, earlier, I spoke about Mr. McMillan's trial, you know, and, and the idea that there are these huge gaps in the evidence that took years to find. Um, at the very end of the movie, um, there's a, um, there are a couple of scenes with uh, Mr. Um, Hinton, Anthony Hinton, Hinton, who was, I guess, Mr. McMillan's it was in the next cell, um, and they talk about how he had been released. Um, he spent 30 odd years on death row. Um, he was released due to a Supreme Court case, his case, where the court found that his trial lawyer was ineffective. His trial lawyer did not know the relevant statute about asking for money so he could get a ballistics expert. So Mr. Hinton was on death row due to a single ballistics report the attorney did not know how to ask for money to get his own expert. He spent 30 odd years on death row for that. So, you know, I would love a top down reevaluation of, of everything, but um, at the same time, let's give the defense attorneys uh, the training and the tools so they can do a better job so that, you know, nobody's life has to become that. So that's my, my focus. Thank you. And Jose, you get the last word. What, what one or two things do you think need to change to, to stop would, the injustices we saw? I would say a couple of things. I, I, you know, coming, from, coming from my situation, I think, um, I think there has to be more involvement um, with those who are directly impacted. Um, there's a lot of good women, men and women that are actually out here now doing a lot of great work um, with different organizations. And I think, um, you know, we are the ones who are most affected by, by the system. We were there. We know, we know what we went through. We, will, we, know, we know our needs. And uh, so I think that um, that's a voice that, that, that um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, they're, they're taking baby steps. So, that, you know, there, are, there is some involvement, but I think there needs to be more involvement. 
and also the narrative, the narrative that, you know, the media is, you know, constantly, constantly, um, they're always talking about the bad things that, that people who are formerly incarcerated do, but there's a lot of great men and women who are out there um, doing great work that you never hear those stories. Uh, we recently just had a, a, a former juvenile lifer who was hired by the Michigan Democratic Party. You know, he was one of two, whoever, you know what I'm saying, whoever been hired by them um, coming out of prison. Um, and you don't hear those stories. And so I think, uh, you know, changing, changing the narrative that we, hear, that we see on, on TV every day um, and allowing those who are directly impacted by the system to be involved in the reform, um, I think are just two small ways that we, can, uh, that we can help, you know, change the system. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, thank you for participating in today's meeting. We've raised many questions and I really truly appreciate your, your thoughtful responses um, and look forward to speaking with each of you um, in the future um, and, and see as we see how things go forward. Um, I'd like to remind our audience to check out the League of Women Voters Facebook page and our website for more information about what the League is doing um, on information as we go through this virtual um, time of meetings. And also to remind you that this has been recorded and will be posted for folks. So um, this is the end of our meeting. And thank you to Mike Chiltonham, Kathy Sedlow, and Jose Burgos for being here with us and um, just providing great information. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.